Hi, it's me, Moses Ender. It's very easy to get confused about all the different naming conventions and codes that are used for lithium-ion batteries. So in this video, I want to explain you what all the different names and naming conventions mean so that you know what the codes stand for and also what is the correct way to name lithium-ion batteries. In this video, I want to go through the different formats and also the different chemistries that are used in lithium-ion batteries and how they are translated in the end to the naming of the lithium-ion cell or battery. So this video will be the first one in a series of videos about lithium-ion batteries uh, where we cover all the different kind of topics from formats, cell designs to chemistries and the characteristics of the different battery types. So first, let's cover the different formats of lithium-ion batteries. So the formats, they are not specific to the chemistry that is used inside the cell. So while the, a certain format could be used for lithium-ion cells, it could also be used for a different chemistry uh, like nickel metal hydrate. But still, formats are very commonly used to just describe what type of battery it is. So let's go first through the formats, and later on, we'll go through the different chemistries and also break down what all this chemistry means. Modern lithium ion cells come typically in three different formats cylindrical cells, prismatic cells, and pouch cells. So, prismatic and pouch basically have the same geometry, but they differ in the way the housing is built. So, I'll explain you that later in more detail. So, let's start with cylindrical cells. The cylindrical shape is a consequence of the manufacturing process of these cells. The electrodes are wound to a roll and that results in the cylindrical shape. So the roll of, uh, of the electrodes that is also called a jelly roll is afterwards put into a cylindrical casing. Cylindrical cells are typically characterized by its dimensions. So you've probably heard of 18650 cells or 1865 cells, and also about the 21700 or 2170 cells. So you already see there is some confusion about the naming convention. Sometimes it's used with a trailing zero, and sometimes without. So the commonly used version of the naming with this trailing zero, so for example 18650 or 21700, comes from a standard for primary cylindrical cells. This standard, the IC standard, uh, 686-1 describes that you use the uh, diameter of the cell in full millimeters and the height of the cell in full tenth of millimeters. So basically the 65 millimeters translate into the uh, 650 and the 70 millimeters of the larger 21700 cell right, translates into the 700 tenth of a millimeter. The IEC standard 61960, which is used for rechargeable lithium-ion batteries, uh, uses the full millimeters uh, for the naming convention. So that would be then the 1865 or the 2170. What is important to note is that the actual dimensions of the cell might be slightly different from what the name suggests. So an 18650 cell could be anywhere from uh, a bit below 18 millimeters to a bit more than 18 millimeters. So depending on where you use your cell and which kind of uh, mechanical setup, right, it might make a difference which cell from which manufacturer you use. So even though the naming might be the same, please check the exact dimensions. So for the rest of the video, I'll try to stick to the naming convention of the correct standard, the correct IEC standard. So I will try to call it 1865 cell, but I might sometimes just slip the 18650. So what different types of cylindrical cells are there? So the most well-known uh, type and size is probably the 18655 cell. So this is historically the, probably the most common format for lithium-ion cells that was used. It was used from the beginning by Sony when they introduced the lithium-ion cell. And it was used a lot in uh, laptop computers and also larger devices. And eventually Tesla made them also popular for electric vehicles. 
so today that format is still very commonly used. There are also other uh, formats that had the same height, for example the 2665, uh, uh, but that was more a niche application that was not that widely used. The next kind of standard format that evolved uh, from the cylindrical shape is the 2170 format. And again, it was Tesla then uh, driving that format because they just required so much cells from that format that many manufacturers then jumped eventually on that new format, which also meanwhile became a standard in the industry. The next new standard, again driven and established by Tesla to a certain degree, is the 4680 format, which they proposed for the new battery packs for the future vehicles. So all of these formats basically have in common that it's always a cylindrical shape. The diameters and the height of the cylinder differs, but the essential production process behind is always the same. The electrodes are basically cut to stripes and then rolled to that cylindrical shape. How these cells differ then internally from its construction, I will cover in the future videos about the different formats. Something that also belongs to the cylindrical shape, but is uh, much less commonly used, are special formats. So also in the cylindrical shape, there are larger cells, larger formats that are used for stationary storage, specialty applications. And one example is the manufacturer EAS in Germany that produces these high power, large size cylindrical cells. But another type is also the very small coin cells. So you might know the, the primary coin cells that are used for smaller electronic devices, but there are also lithium ion coin cells. Um, the most prominently one is probably Vata producing them with their coin power cell, which also is a cell where you have wound electrodes inside, just that it's kind of shrinked and the height is basically less than its diameter. But that's again a specialty application and I might cover that in a future video. So there are a lot of advantages when it comes to the cylindrical cells. First, it is a standardized format. So you can get an 1865 cell from many different manufacturers, which makes it easy to just select what is the best one for you. And that also means there's a lot of competition. And this standardization plus competition means that the cost is also reasonable. So that's basically a good option if you need high volume products, a, a relatively inexpensive cell at a good quality. Because that standardization of also the production process means that the production is very stable and repeatable. Another big advantage of cylindrical cells is that it has a rigid housing. And it has that steel case which protects it from mechanical influence and keeps the electrodes tightly packed. And as you might have seen in my other videos, also in the cylindrical cells there are a lot of safety mechanisms included. So it also makes it a very safe cell. But as always, there are also some downsides of cylindrical cells. First, the thermal management of cylindrical cells is more complicated. With the curved surface of the cylindrical shape, you cannot easily attach a heat sink. Right? So the thermal management, getting the heat out of the cell might be more difficult, especially for high power applications. The other downside of cylindrical shapes is the packaging of the cells into a battery pack. With the cylindrical shape, there's always an air gap between the cells, right? So you cannot fill the whole volume that you have available with that cylindrical shape. So let's take a look where cylindrical cells are most commonly being used. Cylindrical cells are used more commonly in smaller battery systems. That means still they are today used in some cameras and mobile electronics like laptop computers, but they are also used in other relatively small electrical devices such as e-bikes, uh, tools and also vacuum cleaners. But beside these smaller battery systems, they are sometimes also used in larger systems. And the most prominent case of that is probably Tesla, where they use the cylindrical cells also for their large battery packs in the electric vehicles. So let's continue with the next cell format, which is the prismatic cell, 
sometimes also referred to as rectangular cell. And the name comes from the shape of the housing uh, that consists of rectangular faces. The housing is typically made of aluminum or steel. Some manufacturers and for special applications, the housing could also be made of a plastic or polymer material. There's a special case of a non-rigid housing, which is then the pouch cell I will cover next. So the prismatic cell comes in different housing materials, but it always has the same housing shape. Inside, the electrodes could be wound, similar to what is found in the cylindrical cell, or it could also be a stack of electrodes. But I will go into those details in a future video about the different cell designs. The name of these prismatic cells typically contains the dimensions, so the, the height, the width and the thickness, but I'll cover that later in the naming conventions. The biggest advantages of these prismatic cells are the easy uh, packaging of these cells into a larger battery system. So the cells can be easily stacked next to each other, similar like bricks in a wall. Also, the housing is relatively robust. Again, you have that advantage of a solid uh, case of the cell that protects the electrodes from external damage. Finally, these cells can have very large capacities. So depending on the format that could go from very small, like uh, cell phone type formats with a few amp hours up to a thousand amp hours for the largest of these cells. So you have a variety of different cell sizes that are possible in this format and therefore also a variety of applications that you can cover. But there are also some downsides that come with the prismatic shape. First, that can be the cost. So since the whole production process is less standardized, and also the whole assembly is more complicated compared to the standardized cylindrical cell production process, it makes the production more expensive and therefore also the cell cost is slightly higher. Similar to the cylindrical cells, also in the large prismatic cells, thermal management can be an issue. Depending on the size of the cell, thermal gradients inside the cell can become quite big. So to get the heat out of the cell, to cool it down, is not always easy. And last but not least, depending on how the cell is constructed internally, the energy density can suffer. So the amount of energy that you can pack into that prismatic shape uh, can be lower than what you can pack into the cylindrical shape of a cylindrical cell due to the internal construction, the contacting and so on. The main use cases for these prismatic cell types are stationary storage, where you have very large scale uh, battery systems. So you want to have less cells that you want that you have to connect. That's also used a lot in electric vehicles, where again, the same argument is true. You want to have uh, less, but therefore higher capacity cells. And sometimes the smaller versions of these prismatic cells are also used for mobile electronics uh, when you have a small capacity, but still need some protection of the cell, but in a more flat uh, format. The third and last format that I want to cover today is the pouch cell. The pouch cell basically has also a prismatic shape, but in contrast to the hard case prismatic shape that I just explained to you before, it has a thin uh, aluminum and polymer composite foil that is basically uh, wrapped around the cell and vacuum sealed. Pouch cells come in various shapes and sizes and also some very unconventional shapes uh, can be realized for specialty applications. Most commonly they come in a normal rectangular shape where basically you have a relatively thin thickness which makes it perf the perfect choice for mobile electronics such as smartphones. The internal construction of such a pouch cell is similar to what can be found inside the prismatic cells. So either the electrodes are stacked on top of each other or they are wound in a flat shape. The main advantages of the pouch cell format are partially similar to the ones of the prismatic shape. For example, the easy stacking of the cells to a larger battery pack. With the very thin 
housing, this wrapping of the foil, it also makes it very compact. So it has a very high energy density, so the amount of basically dead material around the electrodes is quite low. Depending on the internal construction, pouch cells can be realized in a very low impedance uh, way. So that means that the heat up of the cell is very low compared to other cell formats. One of the main advantages, however, is the shape flexibility. So really you can basically tailor the, the size, the geometry of the cell to your application. That makes it perfect to integrate it in tight spaces and especially uh, devices that need to be very compact, such as phones, for example, can really benefit from that property. So let's take a look at the downsides of pouch cells. First, it has a lower robustness compared to the hard case cells because you just have a thin foil around the electrodes, so it needs some extra protection. And unlike the hard case cells, pouch cells don't have a CAD, a current interrupt device. So that means it has a lower intrinsic safety than the hard case cells, so that needs to be counterbalanced by the battery management system. What comes with the biggest advantage of the pouch cells, the formant flexibility, also leads to another downside, which is the cost. So since the format is not standardized, right, you just don't have the same uh, scale of economics, so the same numbers of cells that you produce, which makes it potentially more expensive to produce a smaller amount of your special format of pouch cells compared to the standardized 1865 format, for example, in cylindrical cells. And there's one more downside that is connected with the non-rigid housing of the pouch cell. So whenever there is gas generated inside the cell, that leads to an expansion, basically, of that foil around the electrode stack. So that is what is called swelling. That can happen slowly over lifetime, where basically the cell slowly increases in thickness. But there can also be a more abnormal swelling that is connected typically to some failure, to some abuse like overcharging, where a lot of gas is generated, which basically just inflates the, the foil packaging of the cell. And then also the cell can basically break open, so that would be the equivalent to the venting of a cylindrical cell. Now, let's take a look where pouch cells are being used. The most common use is still in mobile electronics. So basically every smartphone, every smartwatch, all the, the mobile electronics where you need a relatively high capacity in a small format, they today use pouch cells. But pouch cells are also being used in, for example, drones and RC models where you need very high discharge currents and a low weight. But pouch cells are also being used sometimes in stationary storage, but also more commonly in electric vehicles where you then have large-scale pouch cells that are then encapsulated in a larger battery system. Okay, so this have been the basic and most common shapes and housing options that you can find for lithium-ion batteries. But the housing itself does not describe what is inside. So next I want to walk you with you through the different uh, chemistry types that you find in lithium-ion batteries. So we will be clustering the battery types according to the chemistry, mostly the positive electrode or cathode chemistry. So I will not explain now in this video all the details about what is inside the cell, how the chemistry works, but just give you a rough overview. The first lithium-ion batteries launched by Sony was made of lithium cobalt oxide, or short LCO. So this abbreviation is still used today, and the battery type is still used in a lot of applications where you need high energy density, and at the same time also a relatively high voltage. Then there are some derivatives of the LCO chemistry uh, that also have a layered oxide structure. So the most common one is NMC, or basically a lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. The principle is that you replace part of the, of the cobalt with nickel and manganese. The ratios of the elements that are used in such a chemistry can differ. So it started with an NMC111, where basically uh, you used equal amounts of nickel, manganese and cobalt. 
and there have been efforts to reduce the amount of cobalt. So basically, more cobalt was replaced by nickel and manganese, which led, for example, to chemistry like the uh, 532 or the 622 chemistry. Basically, only 20% of the transition metal were cobalt. Meanwhile, we have arrived at the NMC 811, where basically 80% is nickel and just a little bit of manganese and cobalt inside. So replacing part of the cobalt from the original lithium cobalt oxide chemistry makes the, the material less expensive and also more environmentally friendly. Main use cases today are in electric vehicles and basically yeah, almost all mainstream applications, so also mobile electronics and other smaller battery systems. Another derivative of the original lithium cobalt oxide is the NCA or the nickel cobalt aluminum oxide. Again, here most of the cobalt is replaced by nickel, so cobalt is still used for the stabilization of the structure and some aluminum is added, but only a few percent. Again, the advantages are similar to the NMC. You reduce the cost and you also make it uh, more environmentally friendly. So the material is used again mainly for uh, automotive, that is especially Tesla, but also a lot for mobile electronics. Also for the NCA, the overall nickel content is somewhere in the range of 80 to 90 percent. So that makes the advantages of NCA quite similar to the ones of NMC. So meaning uh, reducing the cobalt makes it less expensive and also more environmentally friendly. One of the main use cases of NCA is in electric vehicles, and that is basically the chemistry that Tesla started with, but it's also used a lot in mobile electronics. Next, I want to cover a completely different electrode material, which is the lithium iron phosphate or also LFP. It uses iron as a basis and therefore uses mainly very abundant elements, which makes it again much cheaper and also much more environmentally safe. One of the biggest advantages of LFP is its thermal stability, which makes it much safer to use in large battery systems. But at the same time, it also has a lower energy density, which comes mainly from the reduced cell voltage. This makes the material ideal for uh, applications where basically the energy density, the mass and, and also the size, the volume is not as critical. So mainly stationary storage. But recently the material has also been in the news a lot for use in electric vehicles, especially for the more mid-range vehicles uh, that don't need the extra long runtime. Again, there was announcement by Tesla made for the mid-range vehicles to use LFP in the future. But also in China, there are a lot of vehicles that already use or have been using LFP basically for years. And last but not least, there's the lithium manganese oxide or short LMO. This material avoids the cobalt completely, which again makes it cheaper and also more environmentally friendly than the cobalt oxide based materials. In addition, also, it's thermally more stable than the, the cobalt based chemistries, which makes it ideal also for applications, for example, for electric vehicles. But naming battery systems only after the cathode being used in it is not completely correct. Most of the different uh, cells use a very similar anode or negative electrode composition, which today is mainly based on graphite with maybe some silicon added. But since the anode is so similar in most of the cases, basically we can classify the batteries just according to their cathodes. There's one exception, however, which is the lithium titanate oxide or short LTO that is used on the anode side. Again, this anode can be combined with various different cathodes. So also there, just the naming LTO cell is not completely correct. LTO as an anode material has some advantages and some drawbacks. So the biggest advantage is that it's very stable. So it has a very long lifetime and it also can be charged very quickly. That comes with the downside of having a much lower cell voltage compared to the graphite based systems which reduces energy density and basically uh, disqualifies it for all the applications where you need a high energy density. So it's really a more a niche chemistry for applications where you need fast charging times, maybe high currents also in discharge, but basically less capacity, less energy inside.
So if you take now both the format and the chemistry and put it together in one naming convention, that is exactly what the IEC standard 61960-3 has done for rechargeable lithium-ion batteries. The standard does of course cover much more than just the format. It also covers ways how to measure the battery or the cell to obtain values and properties that are comparable with each other. But if we take a look on how the naming is defined in the standard, we see it is an, it is an alphanumerical code. So the first number and the last one indicate the number of cells in a, in a battery that is connected in series and the number of cells connected in parallel. These two numbers are omitted for a single cell. So we remain with three letters and three numbers. So let's take a look at what these letters and numbers stand for. The first letter stands for the negative electrode material. So depending on which letter you will find on the cell, you will have a different anode material or a different basis, chemical basis for the anode material. So an I stands here for a carbon-based negative electrode, L for a lithium-based, T for a titanium-based, and basically all other elements on which the anode chemistry is based are represented by an X. For the positive electrode, there are much more material options. So the most common ones that you will find on your cells or batteries will be a C for cobalt, a N for nickel, and a M for manganese. The third letter represents the shape. R stands for a cylindrical shape and P for a prismatic shape. The remaining three numbers are representing the dimensions of the cell. The first one stands for the diameter in a cylindrical cell or for the thickness for a prismatic cell and it indicates the maximum value that can be measured there. Similarly for the width of a prismatic cell which is omitted for cylindrical cells and again the height of the cell indicated as a maximum value that can be measured. What is important to note is that all these values are rounded to the next whole numbers. So we always have a whole number which indicates basically the dimension in full millimeters. So let's go through an example. Here you see the naming INR 1966. So according to the naming scheme that we looked at before, the I stands for the anode material, which in this case is carbon-based. The N stands for a nickel-based cathode, and the R indicates the format which is cylindrical. The dimension 19 stands for the diameter, and that could represent anything that is larger than 18 millimeters to maximum 19 millimeters, so it could, for example, be 18.2. Again, for the height, uh, the 66 millimeters indicate that the height is somewhere in the range of 65 point something to maximum 66 millimeters, so it could also represent a 65.1 millimeter. So as you see, the dimension numbers here don't give you the exact dimensions and also the letters don't give you the exact chemistry. Let's take a look at another example. In this case, the INP again stands for a carbon-based anode, a nickel-based cathode in a prismatic shape. And then you have the three numbers that represent the dimensions, the thickness, the, the width, and the height of the cell. So as you see, this naming convention gives you a rough hint on what the basic chemistry is, but it doesn't tell you the exact composition. Similarly with the dimensions, so uh, the numbers tell you the maximum dimensions, but it could be up to one millimeter smaller. So I hope this gives you now a better idea of what you can derive from the names of a battery in terms of their chemistry and dimensions. So the next videos in this series will focus on the internal construction of the cell and also the different chemistries, what exactly are the characteristics of the different uh, cell designs, different chemistries, what are the pros and cons. Okay, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed the bit more fundamental style and you still learned something new. If you did or if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. See you in one of my next videos. Till then, stay charged.